Hi, I'm Gary Allen, your landscape design host for today's project. Some exciting things for you in mind, some renovation in the front yard. But in the back, we'll be installing a stone surface patio. By the time we're done, we guarantee that this house will have a designer's landscape. There are some lush, healthy plants already existing on this home site. And if you notice, most of them are circulated or encompassed around the house. And that's natural because that's where we begin. I mean, when the builders finish a house, they want that impact right around the home. So the next phase or stage is getting out into some of these perimeter areas. I wanted to show you a bed we've cleaned out here and try to explain or understand the purposes for it. With the walk coming in, everything is pushed up against the entrance. This will help really enlarge or give us a little more weight, balance here, if you will. And then it's a great opportunity to come out of the door and hold our attention in. Now what it does in addition is it circulates us through the lawn area here. This is what we call a thumb bed. Yes, it is kind of sticking out, but it helps move our attention through the yard. In other words, it's that 3D, that other layer out. Now, uh, even though we have a straight line of shrubs to deal with along the house, we kind of see uh, what we do there. I want to try to take advantage of these curves, but I want you to see what we've done here. If we go back and show you the befores, well, it's fairly predictable. In other words, we had grass all the way into the corners around the driveway and even at the street. So here we've taken the turf out and I hope you can see this big circular development that's coming on. I mean, that's what we want you to do. We want your eye to roll through here instead of just have a stiff look up around the house. Make sense? Okay. And as you can see, we've got the beds prepped out. We've added another bed here for framing and with the street light, the lamp, the cable box, and the power box, we hope to seclude some of that, hide it or screen it, but that is the first thing we'll see. Now we've added another bed over here on the right side of the drive too. What plants and varieties we use right now aren't important. I want to share with you the overall concept or design. What do you say we now enter the backyard and talk about some ideas there? Backyard certainly has some big challenges for us. When I first came to the the site, notice this square or rectangular patio. And so our goal is to take the square and make it curved or French curved, rounded. We asked the question many times, do patios have to be square or rectangular? Well, not at all. We find really that uh, the French curves help complement our bedline curves. And friends, we have come in and cleaned out along the back side of the fence and opened things up, if you will. And we've got some movement. Now you can tell the difference of the old square rectangular patio and how we've curved this under here. We're not so concerned about the finished product or surface of the concrete here because we will come in with a little stem wall and so our sidewalk will continue all the way through the gate. Even over here, I don't know if you can see where the square of the patio we've cut off with the saw so that our French curve will come into play there. Now also, we with the canopies and the environment back here, we'll be adding some nightscaping. I guarantee it's going to look better. As our landscape rehab or remodeling progresses, uh, we do well to stop and think and consider what plants might stay, what will go. And by looking at this Savannah holly, it is diseased, it has some galls, and so I can tell you right now the homeowner expressed their concern that it will no longer be part of our landscape. We also had a high maintenance, we have a high maintenance hedge here that has to be pruned, clipped, topped continually. What we've started to do is come in and pull out every other one of these ligustrums. Our goal is to transplant some to the back, take them from large shrubs, into being patio or specimen trees. Do you see that starting to shape up as we take off lower branches and allow the, the tops to uh, continue and flourish? So instead of this high maintenance shrub or hedge, again, uh, we're converting to a low maintenance tree. So we'll pull out every other one. 
Well, as you can tell, our plants have arrived to the job site and we are excited. I can't wait to show you some of the new varieties that we have to share with you. And we have some good staple material, the dwarf nandina, a mystery gardenia, red ruffle azaleas, a couple different varieties there. Even our African iris and a dwarf crepe myrtle. Uh, I want to show you a couple varieties that something that we haven't had the opportunity to use in a long time. Uh, two things in the cycad family. This is commonly known as the Kunti palm. It's Zamia floridana, and it is not really a palm, but it is a cycad. And this beautiful drought tolerant plant has a, a really good cold tolerance. Again, grows natural in the sandy soils of, of northeast Florida and the whole southern eastern part of the United States. As you look on at the specs on it, I think you'll find this as one of the, again, one of the xeriscape type plants that is certainly low maintenance. It seems to take on this evergreen appearance. It doesn't get much taller or bigger than this. I've seen it in right-of-way plantings too in some of, the, some of the highways and byways. You plant it and it just does on its own very well. Behind me here is a three gallon sago. Now this is also a cycad. Can you see the, uh, even the similarity in the growth habit of these two plants? Cycus revoluta, and like I mentioned, the zamia or kunti, uh, commonly known as the sago palm, but this is not a palm either. As I mentioned, it's a cycad. I like the dark green foliage and we use these as lower specimen accents. With these three gallon plants, we can uh, place them in groups of triangles or threes to get more than just, well, the individual impact. As we move on down the line, let's talk about some color. These beautiful hybrid daylilies. We've got four different varieties here and uh, very outstanding. In other words, uh, the, the daylilies, just to go back on some of the history, have been used in plantings in North America and all over North America for decades, even we can say centuries. This plant overwinters as a perennial and uh, comes back to enjoy these beautiful colors in the early spring all the way to mid and late summer. And so uh, a very good plant staple. The varieties we have here to really share with you, uh, four as a matter of fact, the Yangtze, which is a beautiful medium yellow, the Prelude to Love, which is a burgundy with this nice yellow or lime throat. And also the Double Talk, which is this gold, a, a bloom within a bloom, so it's a double. And then the Siloam Classic here, another double. So it's a flower within a flower and it has a pinkish or a salmon color to the landscape. So very interesting indeed. Now, as you work your way around, I want to share with you introduction to some antique roses. Now we call them antique because uh, the grower here, developer, has gone into some of the older landscapes and found some rose varieties that are stable, tough, long lasting on their bloom and even fragrant. So we have three varieties here to show you. The red, again, fragrant, that'll get to about a three to four foot overall height. The beautiful dwarf pink, and then these whites that will mix into the landscape. Roses are tough and tolerant. Here in our Florida uh, soils and the climate with the humidity, a leaf spot is a challenge. So again, these have been hybridized or acclimated, brought back into the new landscape given different names. I mean, they have a wide variety of different types here. These just three that we're using for you. <clears throat> well, there's one more plant we need to talk about, and that is over here. Uh, we commonly refer to Pittosporum. Actually, it's Pittosporum, but we call it Pittosporum. I don't know if you can see the taller variety of the variegated back here in the background, but look at this really tight, compact grower. This is Pittosporum or Pittosporum tobira, but Wheeleri dwarf is its uh, cultivar name. Can you see the small, tight, compact growth habit that this plant has? Uh, friends, Pittosporum, as you may well know, get five to six to eight to 10, 12 feet tall if they go unpruned. And they're kind of a tight plant that you have to really keep, keep them well manicured. This is not the case. A nice, compact growth habit that doesn't get much taller than this, and we can depend on these being the low show with that glossy green color for a long time. Now, where will all these plants go? I don't know. We'll have to see. 
Now, if you still have your pen and paper handy, we might review a few other plants that we have here. Uh, two generics or staples that we use somewhat regularly, uh, the border grass and the boxwood here. Uh, relatively pest free, low maintenance, no problems in the landscape. They also go full sun to part shade or shade, and that makes them very flexible. And also, we talk about color or contrast. Uh, this, rather than evergreen giant, is what we call big blue. But look at the yellow green the boxwood has with this deep, dark, or richer green that the border grass has. So even a mix there uh, is better than nothing, let's say. So uh, the big blue border grass is gonna be a staple, like we said, for us. Crepe myrtles, crepe myrtles have, have come a long way. We may be familiar with them in the southeast or south uh, as a beautiful specimen that flowers in the warm season or the warm months. But now with some of the improved varieties, we've got uh, dwarfs that grow like this one, about to a four to a five foot height or maximum. And then some even miniatures or dwarf shrubs. Now this will uh, go deciduous, so we want to use it uh, sparingly and have some green around it, so to speak, to hold it through the winter months. But ideally, we have a display of color here in the summer, which is kind of an off season. You know, a lot of times in the summer, you depend on annuals to give you that color. Well, the lantana, which we use somewhat regularly, again, blooms all through the warm season. It attracts butterflies. Here we have the use of the gold, but there's lavender, reds and pinks, and even the white. Uh, bottom line is a drought tolerant plant that will take the heat, the full sun, and flower like an annual all through the season. Even if you were to start this as a potted plant up north as an annual rather than a perennial, for us it comes back here, uh, it makes a great potted specimen or the fact that it grows so big in one season. You start these guys in the spring like this and by the end of the summer they are about this big. So. Uh, again, a beautiful specimen. Let's move to some of the mystery. This is uh, mystery gardenia. And if you had smell-o-vision instead of just television, you could catch the aroma or fragrance here that I'm enjoying from the gardenia. This other bloom is basically spent, so that could be pinched off just like that. Here's one of the flowers or blooms that we're enjoying with many more buds coming on, you see. A nice glossy green foliage to this and some of the gardenias get a little uh, big or massy in size so they do re need some type of shaping or pruning to kind of keep them in check but the mystery again is a medium grower so it doesn't get so big like the japonicum and finally a nandina now you may be familiar with heavenly bamboo its common name nandina here do you notice anything specific or unique about this particular variety. You see its squatty nature, its dwarf habit? Well, this is Nandina domestica, but harbor dwarf. Yes, this is a ground cover. And can you tell with the little bit of splash of the pink stems and then the yellow green foliage that it has, but also some of the older or mature foliage is a very deep, dark, almost blue. And so as a ground cover, this would be a really a nice texture plant and it's uh, another attribute or a contribution to the landscape is its fall color that will color up very nicely with some of the rich maroon or burgundies there. So as you can tell, I did forget one and that is the happy days azalea. These aren't in full bloom right now, but they're coming on a little bit. What I like about this one, I'm trying to look for a flower. This is a one gallon. Here it is here. It is a double, so it almost looks like a rose. Hard to tell, but these little buds, this beautiful purple type flower, is gonna be a nice compliment to the landscape here. Happy days, Azalea. I was trying to see if I could multi-process while spinning and turning this head on. I've actually taken the riser off of him. You remember the big Indian hawthorn we had here and the pits behind it that were pruned in a square fashion. Can you now see the, uh, the architecture of the home there, the windows now that have come all the way down? And friends, our goal then now is to treat all of this as one big bed, not with the big straight lines we had in here. We've done, uh, we've moved some of the iris and some of the Aztec grass and kind of opened things up. So I want to show you more down the line here. One thing I failed to mention is the Ilex Nelly Stevens, this specimen holly that was full to the ground, 
had foliage all the way touching the bottom, we've cleaned that, clear trunked it, and made it more of a standard or a specimen. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I prefer that look rather than full to the ground. I just feel like having that airy feeling under there and then low plants are gonna help accent and uh, just have it look a little more uh, interesting, if you will. This sago palm, we've moved out uh, some of the potted plants, put the geraniums up on the porch and opened this up. Uh, looks like a little problem, doesn't it? Many of you may have this occurring in your cycads, and really this is attributed to magnesium and or manganese deficiency. What we have is necrosis or a, a deterioration of the foliage, and basically new foliage versus the old. So what do you do in a case like this? Well, manganese and magnesium sulfate can be added as a minor element, and then you see this new head coming out. Well, we'll strip all this unwanted foliage off because it's not gonna come back, and we'll watch this new head so that the fertilization or minor application of elements will hopefully correct over a period of time. Uh, friends, there is one decision here, and that is what to do with these ilex shillings. Um, I'm not sure whether we try to transplant a few. They're a little bulky. They're the only ones on the site. Uh, we might kind of let them sit to the last moment, but we can at least start organizing or developing some other beds here. Uh, there are a couple main design points that we want to go over. Another, we mention them often, but they're really well worth repeating. That is low maintenance in mowing. In other words, think about it. If I've got a lawn mower and I've got to come around and push out this corner, that's a lot of extra work. We've eliminated a corner down there too. But you see <laughs> the circulation we've developed. In other words, mowing now becomes fairly easy and fairly simple. So the curves help there. Now, let's also mention size or scale. The size of the lawn and the size of the beds need to be proportionate. If this bed was really thin and skinny through here, it really wouldn't size out. But I've got on the high reach, I looked where you did, and I feel really comfortable about the scale we have going on here. Another point to mention, our trees, our specimens are tucked inside the landscape beds. In other words, when we get on our turf grass, there are no interruptions, no islands, no individual items to mow or move around. So that keeps continuity and flow working there. Really, if you recall, we had the hedgerow across the front of the house. Now, with our new little opening up, so to speak, we're gonna connect the dots over the sidewalk. We'll use different plants to do that, even continuing here with our dwarf shrubs tucked in the middle, lower shrubs outside here, we will continue this process and move plants along the bed line that really decorate and exemplify the curves that we've installed here or developed. So uh, let's take some time now. We're gonna set up and install some plants and then we'll see how we do. Also, we wanna take note that our oak trees have arrived on the site the live oaks we're going to use here. As a nice shade tree, these are, are semi-deciduous, they, so they won't lose all their foliage in the winter. They will have some fall and winter presentation, so to speak. I notice up in this first tree, there's even a, a bird's nest. So this nice, tight, dense canopy it denotes itself for the privacy that birds even choose. A nice uniform crop here. These should look good. Let's take a moment, place them into our landscape and see what impact they provide. Now we invite you to come with us, take a walk, and let's see what changes we've made and hopefully just what improvements we've made along the way. Initially, I wanted you to see the neighboring bed that we've uh, come up with. Since we're between the properties here and only about a, well, under a 10 foot stretch, the oak tree with the dwarf green pits underneath is a complement to this oak behind me here and does help fill in the space of this large concrete driveway. Also, uh, you may note some uh, dead branching in here. 
really this tree probably was on the bottom of the pile and so you had just maybe a little bit of brittle uh, branches that are broken so we need to clean him but there should be one thing evident here now and that is again this notable difference between texture and color the dwarf Nandina here have a bluish cast or bluish color, which I really like. That bounces or works good off of the little John Azalea, that rich burgundy color. And then the dwarf pits. Now, we talk about including crossing over sidewalks and driveways. And in this case, again, the beds were cleaned out to set up that initiation. And then now the plants help us kind of connect the dots, if you will. Remember what we had here along the front of the house, uh, two straight stretches of a shrub line. Uh, can we do better than that? Can we do something different than that? Friends, I encourage you to get out of the box in your way of thinking. In other words, uh, it, we're kind of tied to certain elements. That is, houses are square and they have corners. A lot of times driveways and sidewalks do the same thing. But the curved bed pattern should soften those stiff, straight angles. So when we open up this as a new bed and we include this in our thought process, uh, try not to go back to straight lines. In other words, let these curves and all of this is one big bed and that's the way we treat them. And so the connection across really gives us some interest as we walk in and toward the, uh, the house or up and down the sidewalk. Um, in here we've used some of the miniature, the uh, antique roses. And what I try to do with our roses, instead of planting them out in the open, all in one bed, we've incorporated them in the landscape so that when they, through the winter, when they don't look so good, they'll have something on both sides and around them that'll kind of hide, conceal, and soften them. Take a look at the Sago. I mean, we've got a couple days. We've had a couple days of our landscape construction. And do you remember the old foliage that had necrosis and was dying? And that new head here has branched out and is really putting out a nice presentation. Since it's taller, we've come down with some lower sagos around it, uh, making use of the pups too at the base. So this is our little sago area of the yard, so to speak. Instead of having them spread out, in this case, we decided to make up just a big impact of the sagos here. And I think that works. Again, some little John Azalea. The gardenias in the background and the African iris with the blue juniper. The contrast is working good here. And if you think about what our heads line looked like before, well, now again, at least we've got some trunk character on these ligustrum, and they will round out with time. And really, now we've got a tree line, and then a shrub line that helps accent the wall. And we kept the lantana in place. So that much even works. Now, I wanna to head toward the street and talk about some of the things we've accomplished there. And finally, our beds that attach to the street help complement the beds we have behind us here. And also, it softens some of the hardware here at the road. I find that it's a little bit challenging, but it helps add that curb appeal that's necessary for a good looking landscape. What do you say we go back now and look at before and afters on the progress we've made here on this project? We'll be here in the backyard finishing up the stone patio, landscape, and night lighting. So we invite you to return for another designer's landscape. Until then, I'm Gary Allen. I'll see you.